Okay, so uh, hello everybody. Uh, so my name is Pierre, uh, and this is the uh, first uh, meeting for the mathematics of uh, planet Earth. So it's uh, my pleasure to start these virtual meetings uh, with uh, Dr. Antonio Busalacci. So I assume uh, all of you uh, know uh, Tony. So uh, he, as I mentioned, he's the inaugural, inaugural uh, colloquium speaker. And so he's presently president of uh, UCAR uh, since 2016. He was a director of the Earth System Science Interdisciplinary Center uh, at University of Maryland for 16 years uh, before that. And he has made many multiple uh, contributions uh, in our field. He's the fellow of the AGU since 2009, uh, fellow of the AAS since 2011, and a elected member of the NAE, so National Academy of Engineering since 2016. And so if we have some time at the end, we will do a little poll. Uh, we have planned other activities than uh, colloquium uh, seminars for the uh, community. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to do a poll at the end for those of you that are still there to give us some guidance on the kind of things that you would like to see in these meetings. But uh, without uh, waiting more, so uh, it's a pleasure uh, to have Tony uh, give us a presentation on Earth System Prediction for the in the 21st uh, century. So thank you very much, uh, Tony, and thank you all for uh, coming. Thank you, Pierre. Thanks very much for the invite and the opportunity. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening to those participating. It's great to see a number of friends and colleagues uh, joining as well. So my thanks to everybody. Uh, this talk is based on an invite I received uh, from IBM at some point to uh, give a talk at their World of Watson conference and sort of peek into the crystal ball of what the future of forecasts uh, might look like. And so, the agenda or outline is sort of listed here. Um, and that being, I believe we are on um, a threshold for a, a new era of, of predictive capability um, that lends itself to a better understanding of the entire earth um, that is going to support a whole range of societal benefit areas. Um, here at NCAR, um, we're helping to usher in this new era of forecasting. Uh, but to continue to push forward, we need enhanced observations, earth system models, high performance computing resources, data analytics. Uh, and to accomplish this task is gonna require uh, more improved, more in-depth partnerships across the government, the private sector and uh, academia. Uh, what we're seeing here is the hand-drawn forecast a uh, weather map that helped guide uh, the invasion uh, of D-Day of the Allies in World War II. So forecasting at this time was still primitive. Uh, we had no real numerical models. We had limited observations, but weather forecasting was essential to planning uh, the D-Day uh, invasion. So the importance of a good weather forecast became quite clear during uh, World War II. And so after World War II, the U.S. made unprecedented investments in forecasting. Uh, and what's shown here is this led to the creation of the first numerical prediction models, uh, which were run on ENIAC uh, in 1950. And so with this new focus on furthering the science of meteorology came the realization that there needed to be a, a focused national effort to coordinate and expand efforts in this nascent area of numerical weather prediction. And that led to the foundation of the National Center for Atmospheric Research in 1960. And so coming out of World War II, our knowledge of the physics and dynamics of the atmosphere, together with the advent of digital computing and this investment in research ushered in this era of numerical weather prediction to the point today where in the United States, we have a multi-billion dollar private sector weather enterprise that really is the envy of the world. And I would submit that we're at a similar juncture today with respect to our ability to predict how the earth system works as a coupled system. 
Now, in the decades that followed, numerical weather predictions became uh, more sophisticated, began to improve, and collectively we began to understand that to improve our predictions further, we, we need to expand our horizon and our scope beyond just the atmosphere. And, and this new way of thinking was born in part as the satellite era uh, began in late 1960s, 1970s. And so the access to these expanded set of observations really um, opened up our eyes per se into how interconnected the earth was as a coupled system. Um, and NASA, the EU with their Sentinel program and other countries now have a fleet of satellites observing the earth. And again, these measurements of the atmosphere, the ocean, the land surface, the cryosphere started to help us piece together uh, the complicated interactions between these different parts of the earth system. And so you can almost hear the theme music for 2001 Space Odyssey in the background. Uh, but that brings us to today. And um, I would argue we are at the dawn of a new era where the investment on the scale we saw after World War II could vastly improve our prediction of uh, the entire Earth system. And so what are we talking about? Uh, Earth system prediction leverages our knowledge of how the different parts of the Earth interact, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, cryosphere, biosphere, even the magnetosphere, um, in terms of how uh, we are influenced by the sun. So when we look at the very core of uh, this picture, at, at the very core is this kernel of the physical system, how the atmosphere, ocean, land, and ice um, interact, and then how that physical kernel interacts with biology, chemistry, marine and terrestrial ecosystems. And then finally, how that natural system interacts with humanity and how humanity um, interacts with the earth system in return. However, this is not ivory tower research unto itself or prediction for prediction sake. The ability to accurately predict the entire earth system is gonna have far reaching impacts for a whole range of societal benefit areas, as you see here. Agriculture, forest, riparian areas, the coastal zone, um, health, the built environment, energy systems. So what does Earth system prediction actually look like? Um, I'm talking about prediction that is seamless across multiple disciplines. Uh, Earth system prediction is also seamless um, in scope, literally from the sun to the bottom of the sea. In the past, our predictive capabilities were kind of on separate tracks. We had uh, the numerical weather prediction community. We had climate variability, the kind of community I came on looking at prediction at El Nino, and then on climate change. And yet we know, as we've seen this um, season, El Nino in the Pacific um, affects and helps to suppress hurricanes in the Atlantic. As we just saw with Hurricane Otis, climate change is expected to affect and intensify severe storms. And so we need to, to bring uh, these different tracks together into a more seamless approach to predictive capability. It also means seamless in space, including predictions that are global, regional, down to the local scale at which stakeholders make their decisions. And lastly, it means seamless in terms of the scale of the processes from the micro scale to the macro scale. For example, an ice particle forming in a cloud to ocean currents that sweep across broad swaths of an ocean basin. And so what I, I would argue, uh, this is the grandest of all grand challenges for environmental and earth science. And Obviously, we only have one planet to live on. We owe it to ourselves to exploit this nascent capability. Now, reasons for my optimism is we're already starting to see some intriguing and, and tantalizing possibilities for the future. Um, and I think we're go going to experience an exponential explosion in our forecasting um, as a result of better understanding of the interconnectedness of the Earth system, um, from renewable energy production to forecast of air quality, harmful algal blooms, threats to fish stocks, crops, oceanic dead zones, vector-borne disease, 
uh, as influenced by weather and climate. And yet, even with a perfect understanding of the connections of the Earth system, our predictive ability and capability is always going to be hindered by the natural chaotic va variability within the coupled system. And so we don't really appreciate what are the limits to predictability of the coupled system. For example, a recent uh, study at NCAR uh, using the community, community Earth System model, CESM, found that we may never uh, ever be able to predict the date by which the Arctic is going to become ice free more precisely than plus or minus a decade or so. Earth system predictions also a matter of nat national and global uh, security. In 1967, a solar storm jammed radar and radio communications. And in the US, that was initially attributed to the Russians and it almost brought our two countries um, to war. Uh, shown here is a video from NASA uh, uh, depicting a coronal mass ejection striking the earth. So the ability to better predict space weather um, could warn society of geomagnetic storms um, from hours to days in advance that have uh, the capability of really crippling our telecommunications network. Um, the last major event was known as the Carrington event in 1859 that literally caused a telegraph wires to, to go on, on fire. And so if we had the scale of a Carrington event today, uh, it would have tremendous and drastic implications across the world. I mean, if you draw a parallel to COVID, where COVID it really brought down the global economy on a couple of, of weeks to a month or so, months or so, um, a huge space weather event would do the same on, on the matter of hours to a date or so. Now, the term climate change as a threat multiplier was coined by, coined by a former trustee of UCAR, Sherry Goodman. Uh, she and I were members on a National Academy's studies uh, that was sponsored by the intelligence community that looked at climate change as a social and political stressor. Um, last year, um, something on the order of a thousand Pakistanis died in the floods in, in Pakistan. And in this unclassified study for the intelligence community, uh, we highlighted Pakistan as an example. So here we have a part of the world that has a very tenuous social, social fabric. Um, it is a country that has the bomb. Um, and yet, on the flip side, during drought conditions, decisions have to be made whether or not to route water coming down uh, from mountain high glaciers, route water into rural areas to support agriculture, or to route uh, water into the major metropolitan areas for power generation in the cities. And when the, the decision is to route water into the rural areas, there are brownouts in, in, in major cities like Karachi. We don't hear uh, that much about that in the Western world. And yet when this happens, there oftentimes are large periods of a social unrest as a result of this interplay uh, betw between climate, environmental conditions, and social political factors. Uh, Earth system prediction is also important to our armed forces. In 2011, I, ch I co-chaired a study for the academies uh, that was sponsored by the Chief of Naval um, Operations to look at the impact of climate change on US Naval forces. And of all the armed forces in the United States, the US Navy is the most enlightened because of their forward presence around the world. They have, are seeing the effects of climate change. Uh, they have a tremendous humanitarian assistance and disaster relief mission, something on the order of $100 billion worth of Navy assets are susceptible to one meter rise in sea level. We've also seen in, in the past, uh, Russians planting a titanium flag on the bottom of the Arctic Ocean. Um, and so the Arctic area is a region uh, uh, across nations for cooperation, competition, and albeit low, still conflict. So we need to have a better understanding and a capability to predict when the Arctic is going to be 
ice free and, and, and allowing for greater access for nation to extract resources, transportation, et cetera. So to move beyond the sort of vision, uh, we need to radically expand our investment. And what I'm talking about in terms of a grand challenge really is on par with the human genome project. And this is gonna require substantial investment as well as cooperation across agencies, countries, and collaboration from scientists um, from different disciplines. And yes, we are in an era of flat and austere budgets, but that's all the more the reason to be planning for um, the future. So to do this is gonna require new ways of working together. Uh, this plot here shows the ratio of US R&D investment to gross domestic product. And what you see here in the blue curve is the federal government investment post-World War II and the Cold War, the model of federal investment in research is no longer valid. And in the sort of orange curve, you see the secular increase in the private sector. And so uh, what this is showing for is, is a more um, concerted effort at partnering across uh, public, private, and federal sectors. I saw this firsthand um, when I was at the University of Maryland. At that point in time, Neil Jacobs was at Panasonic. Uh, Neil is now actually an employee here at UCAR um, after he served as acting administrator of NOAA. Uh, and you may ask Panasonic. So uh, when you fly on an airplane, uh, most of the TV screens, the software that drives the entertainment systems on an airplane um, uh, come from Panasonic. And uh, that system also archives observations um, as airplanes land and take off across the world's airports. And this was a totally new data set for numerical weather prediction. And so Panasonic and Yale were taking those observations in real time, putting and assimilating it into forecast systems. And uh, at Panasonic, Neil was offering uh, graduate student assistantships to our graduate students at the University of Maryland. And so they were getting access to cutting edge research, getting access to more computing time than they might get here at NCAR. And then they were getting the opportunity uh, for a job if she or he wanted some uh, coming out of college. So coming back here um, to Boulder right now, today I can't see the flat irons because it's pretty foggy outside my window. Uh, but we are moving into this era. So um, our history, as I said, goes back to 1960. We had 14 founding universities that came together and started the University uh, Corporation uh, for Atmospheric Research to manage NCAR. And today, uh, our membership has grown to include 126 colleges and universities across uh, North America. And so at UCAR, our mission is to be the best possible steward of the investment of the National Science Foundation in NCAR and provide the resources to lead us into this new era. So NCAR has been managed by UCAR since its very beginning. Um, and at its core um, is the words of our founding father, Walt or Roberts, and that being science in service to society. Um, and we do this, again, being at the, ex at the nexus of government, academia, and the private sector. And so NCAR works across the following Earth system, um, disciplines, meteorology, climate scientists, uh, oceanography, hydrology, ecology, biology, geography, um, and social science. So it's not just the physical and natural sciences, but also um, the, so the social um, society sciences. And so in the next few slides, I'm gonna provide some illustrative examples of some of the work that's going on. So NCAR is breaking new ground. One is in hydrologic prediction. Uh, what you're seeing here is output from our weather research forecast hydrology model. Um, and what you're seeing is literally the, the, the pulse or the heartbeat of the nation's um, stream flow and river reaches as weather disturbances pass across uh, the United States from west to east. So for an accurate hydrological pred prediction, of course, you need a good weather forecast. Um, you also need to understand a lot of other elements of the earth system. You need to know the geography of a river basin. 
uh, soil mo moisture, how saturated uh, the ground is, vegetation cover to calculate transpiration, snowpack, it, uh, et cetera. Warp hydro is just one of many versions of our weather research forecast model uh, that combine basic numerical prediction capabilities with parts of the Earth system. So for example, warp fire combines atmospheric conditions with environmental terrain, fuel characteristics, dynamic feedbacks between fire and the larger um, atmospheric circulation. And what you're seeing here is a visualization of a tall grass prairie fire. And so we've been providing a guidance to uh, the state of uh, Colorado in terms of a Colorado fire prediction system. Here is a simulation of a wildfire from about 12 years ago, not too far from um, where I live, kind of north and west of where I live. Uh, NCAR science is also being used to predict how much wind will be available for renewable energy. And, and we've recently launched a solar forecast system. So here in the Mountain West, our major energy provider is Excel Energy. And as a result of our partnerships with them on renewables, we've saved the rate payers here um, on the front range around $49 million over 10 years as a result of more accurate prediction of renewables. Uh, and now, uh, it, going more to the physical climate system, another example is heat wave prediction. So shown here, this sort of fingerprint of sea surface temperature anomalies in the Pacific Ocean that have been shown to precede heat waves over the continental U.S. by up to seven weeks um, in advance. And new research is finding that by looking at um, other hydrologic variables, such as uh, snow melt, soil moisture, that we're better to predict uh, what's known as flash droughts that come upon us um, quite unexpectedly. So we're now getting a better understanding of our, what are the antecedent conditions for a range of droughts, and then what that means for wildfire susceptibility. So uh, oftentimes now, um, you see on uh, television graphics such as this from the drought monitor, this one is from uh, 11 years ago, showing uh, the 2012 summertime flash drought that brought something on the order of $30 billion to damages in the Midwest. I alluded to sea ice early on, and so um, some work at NCAR has shown that more accurate uh, representations of the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation is important for making decadal predictions of what sea ice is going to be doing over the coming decade. And we're also doing uh, work with the Center for Disease Control and finding correlations uh, between the increased occurrence of West Nile virus and above uh, average temperatures in, in the season and year before as well as those diseases such as malaria and dengue that uh, are known to have precipitation as a, as a strong driver. So against this backdrop then of illustrative examples, what do we need to push this science further and eventually making operational Earth system forecasts? So as shown, uh, we need more, better, and new observations cutting edge high resolution models, high performance computing resources needed to bring this all together in a new way of analyzing the observations and model output uh, and data simulation that brings this all together and artificial intelligence and machine learning to make more efficient use of the observations modeling and HPC resources. So earlier we spoke about the large satellite platforms, but we're also seeing a revolution in other observational technology and platforms. Uh, with the Internet of Things, these platforms can write observations um, in a different sense to drive tomorrow's Earth system models. And the ability for everyday objects to connect to one another and exchange data opens up new uh, possibilities for um, collecting observations. Um, at UCAR and NCAR, we're making progress in a number of these um, areas. In uh, least developed countries, um, there are capacity challenges. So what we've been uh, doing in one area 
is developing 3D printed weather stations, low cost. Um, if there's vandalism in an area, they're easily to be replaced. They've been deployed in Kenya, Zambia, and, and other areas where there's not a lot of interest infrastructure and capacity. And at the same time, um, they're used as a teaching platform um, as well. In the future, we're also going to be able to make use of observations from sensors embedded in everyday objects, in homes, in vehicles. Uh, one example is a sensor technology we created here that's used on snowplows to provide near real-time observations of winter road conditions. And then that those data can then in real time be uh, assimilated into our forecast models. And so, as I mentioned, devices are now in, embedded in everything from household appliances to cell phones to vehicles. And so with the internet of things, these platforms can provide observations to feed uh, tomorrow's earth system models. One example is smartphones um, that have can have a, a barometric pressure app on them. Now, there are questions about accuracy and precision, but when you have something on the order of 40 billion of, of these sorts of, of advisors, root N really helps you uh, beating down the air as a result of the just sheer magnitude of the observations. And uh, we are obtaining more observations from small satellites, which can be more agile and cost effective. Um, the, the era of uh, what I'll say the Battlestar Galactica uh, satellites, they are the size of a school bus. That path is not sustainable. So we need to go uh, in the direction of more small satellites, CubeSats. This is another area in our UCAR community programs. We've developed a program called Cosmic, uh, where we use the radio occultation of GPS satellites. Uh, the, the GPS signal through the atmosphere is a function of the temperature and humidity of the atmosphere. And we can use that time delay, measuring that time delay, and do an inverse problem to essentially do like a CAT scan of the temperature and humidity uh, of the Earth's atmosphere. And shown here are some Cosmic 2 satellites that were deployed uh, on a SpaceX uh, Falcon Heavy in 2019. Drones, uh, another platform, cover a range of sizes from small quadcopters to Global Hawk shown here. In particular, the smaller and mid-sized ones can represent a game changer for atmospheric observations in the boundary layer, in remote areas over land, ocean, and ice, and serve to fill gaps. Um, they're going to prove very important in urban canyons. So if you want your Domino's pizza to be delivered right side up, we need to know about turbulence in urban canyons. And in order to do that, we need to take observations and again, assimilate those observations into high resolution urban models. Drones also apply to the oceanic realm. What's shown here are these gliders that are neutrally buoyant and, can, and profile by changing the size of their bladder from uh, order 200 down to thousands of meters, as well as uh, pinnipeds are outfitted with sensors that can measure um, ocean's temperature, oxygen content, uh, chlorophyll concentration, temperature, et cetera, in, again, remote areas such, such as um, under uh, uh, sea ice and ice shelves. Meteorologists have long recognized the value of having automated interconnected observation systems. What's shown here is on the right hand side is Lake Michigan. So this is a mesonet in the Midwest, uh, Illinois, Wisconsin, et cetera. There are now something like 36 states across the country that have their own mesoscale meteorological um, observational networks um, to provide road information and help improve, uh, you know, very uh, short-term hourly forecast to the citizens in those states. So at the outset, I mentioned we need to span from the global to the local scale across disciplines. So one of the biggest challenges is need the need to model the Earth system at high resolution with limited computing resources. Right now, the global community is striving to have one kilometer resolution for these seamless models. Um, and at NCAR, um, the path to doing this 
is with our, our new era of uh, modeling. The platform is the modeling for prediction across uh, scales that has a variable resolution that you see here. And, and so the telescoping grid allows you to have high resolution where you need it and low resolution, let's say over the oceans where people don't live. So again, this allows for a seamless view of the impacts from the global phenomena down to regional and local scales. And this is also a good example of a partnership with IBM. And then with our partnership with IBM, MPAS was ported over to GPUs um, to improve the computational efficiency. So obviously we need ever uh, increasing HPC resources. Shown here is our third generation machine at our supercomputing facility in Wyoming. Um, we had rubric cutting in August. It has peak performance of just under 20 petaflops, about four times faster than its predecessor machine uh, known as Cheyenne. And this machine has an 80-20 split between um, CPUs and GPUs. Um, and yet for the high resolution models needed for future Earth system prediction, uh, we clearly need to move to exascale uh, platforms and at a minimum, uh, a 50 times greater increase in our capabilities that we have access to today. If we look at today's observations and the output from today's prediction models, uh, this is indeed a big data challenge. Um, at UCAR's Unidata uh, part of the organization, we partnered with Amazon Web Services to put the nation's weather radar data in the cloud. And as a result of having the next rad data in the cloud, they're easier to access uh, along with uh, tools needed to visualize and analyze those data. And as a result of the data being in the cloud, uh, the access to the data has increased by about uh, 2.5 times because of the ease of access being in the cloud. Now, um, going forward, the vast amount of data that uh, is gonna be created, more observations, more sophisticated models, it's gonna require machine learning and data, uh, data analytics to help us go forward. Um, I would argue in the not too distant future, the time is gonna come where the day-to-day, -day, the 24 hour weather forecast, that the standard to be is gonna come from um, artificial intelligence, not from a numerical weather prediction model. Uh, several years ago, we hosted the American Meteorological Society a Summer Forum, and I made that statement in public and it met with some resistance from my colleagues in NOAA, but we're, we're almost to that point um, there today. And it's not just AI for data mining or prediction, but it's also for data simulation, uh, the manner in which we merge observations um, uh, with, with models. And so as we get closer at the end, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pivot um, and, and give and speak to the Gulf of Mexico as an example of a regional earth system um, approach. Um, I live part of the year in, in New Orleans and this part of the, and I went to school in, in Florida. Um, so I know the area rather well. The Gulf is really a microcosm um, for the earth system. And uh, it's sort of an unfortunate example of why is the Deep Horizon disaster in April 20th of 2010. Um, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, their response after the fact to the Deep Horizon uh, disaster was truly um, admirable. It involved every sort of line organization in NOAA, the National Weather Service, the National Information Satellite Data Information System, NESDIS, uh, the Office of Oceanic and Atmospheric Research, OIR, National Marine Fisheries, National Ocean Service. And yet, a priori, there is no way to fund R&D at NOAA that cut across all those areas, weather, water, climate, fisheries. And so the Gulf is a perfect or imperfect example of a region under the influence of multiple stressors across the physical, natural, and human coupled system. Something on the order of 50% of the world's population lives within 100 kilometers of a coastline. And the United States, 39% of the US population live in coastal counties. And so the Gulf of uh, Mexico, as shown in this sort of cartoon, is uh, subject to the effects of the loop current, 
um, ocean eddy dynamics, severe storms, uh, rapid intensification of tropical storms, oil spills, harmful algal blooms, nutrient loading coming down the Mississippi, causing hypo hypoxic or dead zones in the Gulf. Uh, the coastal communities are dependent on the, the boom and bust cycles of heavy industry. Relative sea level of rise caused by uh, global warming, but also pumping out oil and water causing subsidence. And so as part of the settlements um, of Deep Horizon, BP and Transocean, um, as part of the judicial settlement, um, were directed to give $500 million to the National Academies to give out in grants over the span of 30 years. So early on, I was on the advisory panel for the Gulf Research Program that has as its mission to improve understanding of the interconnectedness of the region across human environments and energy systems. And so here's a vision uh, for a regional Earth system prediction for the Gulf of Mexico on the time scale uh, of what could happen uh, for a predictive capability across time scales, integrating a regional her, uh, human system model and a regional Earth system model bridging physical and natural systems. And uh, while I was at Maryland, we developed such a system for um, the Chesapeake Bay, but such a platform, should it be uh, developed, uh, could be used much like evaluating the trade space in a satellite program. You could have uh, a query system that would enable stakeholders to examine single or multiple stressors uh, simulate future scenarios, uh, analyze single or multi-threat risks, uh, assess the risk to critical uh, infrastructure systems, to kind of do um, if-then scenarios uh, by, again, bringing together the observations of the region, satellite observations, institute um, observations, and bringing them into a scenario-driven uh, query system for these sorts of societal benefit areas on the right. So then to wrap things up, I would submit then that this challenge and the opportunity it prints, presents is going to lead uh, to a new Earth system prediction uh, enterprise. So much like we saw with the growth of the private sector weather enterprise, and now somewhat belatedly, with climate services in the decades ahead. It's not gonna happen overnight. Um, I, I anticipate we're gonna be seeing a much stronger move into this direction. And much like medical research, where we have sophisticated tools and techniques to analyze the human body, uh, we're gonna foresee the opportunity to better diagnose and predict um, the health of our planet. But to do so, uh, as I reiterate, it's going to require cooperation and investment across all three sectors, academia, government, and the private sector. Uh, and so if we exercise the will to make Earth system prediction a priority, uh, we have the potential to avoid and mitigate some of the disasters that have uh, unfolded on the past severe storms, wildfires, droughts, floods, etc. So in conclusion, thanks very much for the opportunity today. Um, as you can see, I hope you can see, I'm quite upbeat about the prospects for the future. And it's quite exciting to be um, at this, you know, in this field at this point in the history as we go forward. So again, uh, I think we have some time for questions. So thanks again for uh, your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Tony, uh, great uh, presentation. Uh, anybody with uh, questions, you can either raise your hand on or go ahead, what, whatever you prefer. And if you don't want to talk, you can also ask the questions uh, in, on the chat. Uh, Tony, if I can ask a question. Please. I'm Hans Kapper. Um, all these efforts seem to be concentrating on the Northern Hemisphere. How do you expand into the Southern Hemisphere? So uh, I, I would say it's a mistake to say they're focused on the Northern Hemisphere. Um, it's true that a lot of the major um, 
modeling centers are in the northern hemisphere, but a perfect example is the advances in numerical weather prediction. Um, the, the best example is actually the impact of satellite observations in the southern hemisphere. Uh, because there's not a lot of observations there, that's where we've, we've gotten the greatest advance in numerical weather prediction is the impact of, of observations in the summer's southern hemisphere. The other point is, is clearly when you come down to Amazonia, you know, that is the, the greatest part of deep tropical convection that in, involves circulation um, across the world. And as we're seeing right now, we have an El Nino in the Pacific. We have terrible drought conditions um, in Amazonia. Um, my wife is Brazilian. I have a nephew who worked for WWF in Brazil. And the slides, you know, the pictures of the Amazon before and after over the past uh, the past three months is extremely dramatic. So I, I appreciate the comment, but that's the point. We're talking about a global predictive um, capability. And, and the slides I showed were in Southern Africa of deploying these sort of low cost sensors. So this is a world effort. Yes, it, it's true that the major HPC centers and modeling centers are in the Northern hemisphere, uh, but the forecasts are for across the globe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hans, for the question. Thank you, Hans. Uh, Will, William, I think you're, you're next. Thank you. Yeah, for um, uh, a very interesting uh, presentation for uh, initializing and verifying um, comprehensive Earth system predictions across the many Earth system components, it's uh, essential to have a, uh, an Earth system reanalysis. Yep, uh, what are uh, NCARs, uh, does NCAR have uh, plans for advancing science in that area? So, yeah, thanks, Bill. Thanks for the question. You know, and that really comes down to data simulation. And so what I didn't highlight here is not, is not at NCAR, it's at um, our, our UCAR community programs. We host the Joint Center for Satellite Data Simulation. And, and that is a effort across NASA, NOAA, the DOE um, to, about, to develop the next generation data assimilation system across your system, not just the atmosphere. And so that is the future JEDI is the name of the platform uh, for doing data assimilation in this country. And in fact, the UK Met Office um, is looking at the JEDI system to be their next generation data simulation, both for initializing forecasts and um, for reanalysis. So we're quite um, excited about uh, the, what the efforts of the Joint Center is doing. And it's moved beyond just the satellite. I mean, it's clearly um, in situ observations as, as well. So a big effort here on data simulation. Yes. Thank you. Yes, go, go ahead, uh, Sananta. Thanks, Pierre. Uh, so, Santa, Kila. Um, hi, Tony. A nice talk and presentation as always. Uh, question to you is about, um, like you answered Hans' question about the observational coverage is along the same lines. Now, uh, historically speaking, we do not have observations in the Southern Hemisphere. Yes, yeah, sure, satellites have ushered in the era since the 80s. But still with the satellites, we don't have a choice on whether it's a polar orbiter or a geostationary, and we don't have coverage in the 80s in the geo. Then we have LEO coming in. Now the geo is coming back big time. And then the CubeSats will be there, you know, as you showed. Um, and we don't have much of a choice in, you know, as as uh, as data assimilators, let's say. We don't have much of a choice on what we can assimilate. We are you know, delta hand. Uh, so what can we do? Uh, uh, of course, you know, there are OSSEs and OSCs and all that, but are there other avenues that you would advocate or uh, envision as so, the future? Uh, yeah, so I think you, you you answered my question. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, I, think, I think I saw Eric Hackert here, uh, one of my colleagues. You know, I'm a strong, strong proponent of, um, avert, observing system simulation experiments um, to help guide us to prioritize. And so where, you know, where do we need, you know, we have limited resources, especially in developing parts and least developed parts of the world. Where do we need, where we're going to get the biggest bang for the investment in in situ observations. 
And I think that's where Aussies can help us and, and going to areas like the Green Fund to help and the, the development banks because, you know, funding funding for observations in remote parts of the world is very difficult. And so I think we need to be able to, you know, maximize our resources and then demonstrate that with this investment, we'll be able to expand and enhance predictive skill for that region, and less so for the global uh, you know, the, the the large countries in some sense will take care of themselves, but to demonstrate what investment in these observations in this part of the world will lead to improved forecasts for the betterment of the society in that region. And I think observing system simulation experiments have an important role to play there in terms of prioritizing. Yep, so thanks for the question, really good.